is uh, Tobias DLC MHT. I think it's time to finally make a start on the MTech ZM2 set match. So I've prepared it as follows. I managed to apply this paper sticker to the front panel and spray paint it with some top coat. It looks disgusting, but this is what it is. And then I mounted all the switches and connectors and the two variable capacitors. And um, yeah, well, the next step is to start wiring this thing up. And conveniently, the tutorial comes with a decent manual how to wire it up. And uh, yeah, this is what I try to do here now. You see me soldering in the capacitor at exactly the wrong position. Thank <laughs> you. 
Say we consider step one done. Okay, I decided to keep this video short and not film the rest of the build because it's, <laughs> I think, pretty boring. Um, the only thing that I learned uh, from this 3D free flying setup that it's a pretty different, uh, it's a different way of uh, kit building because you have to think not in just two dimensions like on a PCB, so, but basically in three dimension you can, you know, um, use three dimensions to, to position your wire. You don't have to, at the, at the top view, you don't have to keep everything, you know, on a t 2D plane. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you have basically three dimensions and that also um, poses a bit of, well, challenges because you have to think if you, if you connect some wire and it ends up at, at the bottom of your Z axis um, then uh, uh, if you solder something on top and then have to go to the bottom then you have a bit of problems to to access this place and so on so you have to think a bit which wire to put on in which order um, everything is nicely described here in the manual but um, yeah if you are not used to this 3d build process it's not so easy and i made a bit of a mess of it um, here on this side where we have the tuning circuit with the LED. So there's a LED, a small um, diode, one kilo ohm resistor. And then this whole contraption on this side with the resistors, um, that's basically the tuning indicator. And uh, I, well, as shown here in these pictures, I prepared my two uh, 350 ohm resistors like this. And in hindsight, that was maybe not the best idea because then I had problems um, placing these 250 ohm resistors here on the corner of the uh, switch. So if I would have looked before that this is how it should be mounted, I would have probably, um, well, used all four resistors and prepared them in one go. And then they would uh, snug nicely here around the corner like here on, on, on this side, on this side of the, of the switch. And now it's a bit of a mess. So if you can see here, it's not, it's not pretty, but as it's the tuning circuit, it probably doesn't matter because it's not in circuit when, uh, once the tuner is tuned and you're operating, uh, that nasty bit here is not in circuit. So might be okay. And uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, you have uh, from this pin of the switch, uh, you have the 100, well, the 50 ohms going to this pin. Then you have from this pin, the 50 ohms going to the cathode, um, cathode of the LED. And then from the cathode of the LED, it goes here to ground. So this section is pretty sta straightforward to wire up. Um, as I said, you should probably only double up your two 100 ohm resistors in parallel to form 50 ohms after you figured out how how to solder it to the switch um, i did it the wrong way around and now it's messy okay and uh, as you can also see i've moved the capacitor again in initially i had it very nicely put in here between but uh, this is like a bad cookbook <laughs> no i'm not complaining too much my own fault um, uh, you should look through the whole manual and here it says uh, place T2 in this area. So basically here, yeah. So I had my capacitor exactly uh, in the location where the, well, I had the capacitor in the location where the toroid T2 should go. So I had to move it again. And in hin hindsight, I should have also moved the capacitor a bit more to the other side. So another five millimeter here to the right. And that would have given me enough space for the 50 ohm capacitor. So here I've marked it here in, in red. This is where the capacitor should probably go. And then you have to, you know, bend the wires a bit backwards and to, to come round to this pin, but no big deal.
Um, yeah, what else can I say? Yeah, the toroid. Everybody is frightened of toroids, but this one is pretty easy. It has five turns, a tap, and then another 20 turns. The tap goes to this end. And as you can see here, you see the twisty, twisted wire. It goes to this pin of the switch. Uh, the end with the 20 turns, as you can see, is connected to the one kilo ohm resistor, which is here, and then goes to the rectifying diode for our LED. And the other end with the five taps is just um, connected to the cathode, like here. So I think, um, yeah, in terms of placing the toroid, I did a nice job. I messed up with the resistors, but might or might not matter. Um, the only nasty thing is that they say these resistors get very hot during tuning. So as they are very close to the side of the case, I will figure out if it melts the case or not. Yeah, so I don't know, having this you know, five millimeter, everything here to the right, but then you have to be careful with the knob, yeah, well, you're probably still, yeah, they could have probably nudged this all five millimeter inwards a bit. But uh, yeah, that's just me complaining. Okay, uh, on the other side, um, yeah, I had to mount the toroid and I've also shortened a few wires. So at the beginning I had this, this one was a bit too long. So I made it a bit shorter and you know, I had quite sharp bends here at the end here for the ground connection. So I made it a round bend. I had to, as, as I said, I had to get used to this 3D construction method a bit, but um, I think in the end it's, it's looking okay apart from the resistors here. What else can I say? Um, yeah, connecting the toroid. It's also pretty straightforward. Let me put this thing side by side so that you see the description and my ugly mess. Um, yeah, it's anyway. It's it's numbered here. Pin one of the oh, pin one of T one goes to um, connection A of C two, and this is this red bit which sneaks down here. Um, to pin A, maybe you can see it if I tilt it, you can see the red wire coming here at the bottom between the two polyvericons out and connecting here to um, pin A. Um, pin 2, which is the tap here or one side of the uh, five turn, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, five turn tap goes to connection A. So again, you have to just yeah, sneak your wire somewhere <laughs> gently around and solder them. And I, lost a I used a lot of flux um, to get nice shiny connections. That always helps. Pin 3 goes to uh, C2 uh, pin B. And you can see that as well from here sneaks down here to this side. And um, yeah, pin four and five are here this, uh, well, the output basically, coupli the out output coupling thingy. Uh, it goes to the, um, well, to the output terminal or to the output um, BNC connector. And I think the only thing you have to be careful about is as they say, be sure to twist the wire. You still have to remember which was the end close to pin six, because this is probably the end that should go to ground here. So here I painted it in, in, in blue. Uh, on the printout, it's stripy black, very, very, very dark gray. So if your eyes are not the best, I'm telling you, make sure that this end <laughs> Um, basically this black end here goes to ground and the other end goes here to the, um, yeah, to the red connector. 
I think if you use something like a dipole or so, or, or then it doesn't matter. But if you use the the ground switch, which basically shorts, well, it connects this black end with this red end. Well, basically sh shorts these two sides together because here's the switch. As you can see, this one goes here. Then when you flip the switch, then there's a connection here basically to ground. Yeah, and I don't think or I don't know what happens if you got it wrong and you're accidentally shorting out this end to ground. It's probably not good. So here you have to be careful and it would be nice if the text manual would mention that but common sense always helps. Okay, um, yeah, and as you can see, can go a bit closer. I'm not sure if my camera is automatically, yeah, I think it looks sharp to me. As you can see, I think the side here with the toroid ended up quite nicely. Uh, nothing to complain about. The second toroid mounting is also okay. The only thing where I'm not happy is here with this resistors, but might not matter. Okay, so I've already cleaned it up. I can basically well, flip it around and provisionally tighten the screws in the case or try to mount it in the case. And the case is a bit out of shape. So let's see where it slides in better. So yeah, now I think I got it in. Four screws to gently tighten and not over tighten because it's plastic. And uh, yeah, then we can hook it up to the nano VNA and see if I made a pig's ear out of it or if it's working. And as you can see, I made a mess with the front panel. This paper sticker was not working so well for me. I spray painted it several times with some clear coat. And the result was it picked up all the gunk that was flying around, all the pollen and stuff that uh, was traveling through my garden because I didn't want to do this indoors and inhale the solvents. So yeah, if I had a laser engraver, that would have been, of course, the better way to do it. Just um, Use some scotch, bright, bright scotch, scotch pad. Oh, let's see if that works. The hmm. the <laughs> connector is mighty close here to my screw. Maybe I put the washer in first, and the washer is at least not. Putting pressure on my knob. That sounds wrong. <laughs> yeah, this is not, this is a bit nasty, huh? Bloody hell. Yeah. Okay, well, that was not maybe soup the best way. How they cut that. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, that's not good. Maybe I have to take the knob off, then screw it in, and then put the knob on top. Where is my screwdriver? Maybe this one. Not sure if it's too big already. Uh, yeah, it's too big. Knowing myself, I will probably have to disassemble this another 10 times, so is maybe no need or no good reason to already screw that down. 
So. And now this on top, and of course it will scratch on top of the screw. See? So, me. <laughs> Not nice, but yeah, maybe I find a different screw for this corner. Yeah, see it scratches now on the screw. Not good. But hey, this is this was the way the two holes were drilled. I had not really much much wiggle room here. Maybe I could well, I could try to loosen the screws of the polyvaricon and nudge it in a millimeter or so, but not sure. Okay, see I'm already starting to winch again. This is as good as I could build this kit and others might be able to build it in a nicer way. Okay, the video was already quite long and I could not really get out into the field on the weekend and now it's Monday. So here's just a quick sanity check. 10 meter coax cable connected between nano VNA output channel zero and the set match radio input. On the other hand, uh, 40 meter shortened and fed half wave, but not properly hung up in the air, but laying here on my shack floor and through the open door down into the stairwell. So super dodgy setup, but just as a proof of concept. Um, we are here on the 40 meter band, uh, start frequency 6.9 megahertz, stop frequency 7.3. Uh, the top line here is a SWR of 122.5 and the bottom line is obviously 1 to 1. And as you can see, I managed to uh, fiddle with the set match. And uh, if I here slowly and gently turn the right variable capacitor, you can see how the dip wanders from the start of the 40 meter band to the end. So we can try to get it here somewhere bang in the middle. And uh, then we can play with the other knob and get the dip as deep as possible. And then alternating between the left and the right variable capacitor, you're able to basically tune this to one to one. But here in my dodgy test setup, it's all a bit flaky because just the capacitance of my hand is making a difference. But I wouldn't hold that against the set match. This is just that I don't have proper antennas to test here. Okay, so in theory, um, as you can see, the dip is wandering here from left to, to right. And uh, if I tweak here, I can get it really down to one uh, to SWR of one to one. See, so it's pretty sharp, almost as sharp as a magnetic loop, at least on 40 meter band. I think on the higher band, it's not as sharp. So you might be able to cover the whole band. But again, this is just here with my dodgy wire hanging, uh, hanging uh, out and uh, laying on the floor. So I would not come to great uh, conclusions yet. Let's try this. This is between 17.968 and 18.268 megahertz. And I'm not sure if I am able to catch the dip here uh, before I was able to catch it, but um, yeah, it's pretty sharp. Anyway, in real life, how this should work is, um, ah, here we come, here comes the dip. I think we have a chance of Yes, getting that. Now we're going down. And now I stop the commentary because I'm focused on fiddling. But here, uh, this is what I said earlier. Here you could basically cover the complete band, um, at least with this dodgy test set up right now. 
you could get a good um, SWR over the whole band here. So maybe the higher bands are broadband enough and the lower bands are very sharp. Um, I don't know, I have to test it on a real antenna. And usually you would not use a Nano VNA either. I think you tune to maximum noise first, similar to a magnetic loop. Then you flip the switch to the tune position, uh, transmit, um, maybe a CW carrier um, on your uh, HF radio. Uh, this is a QRP tuner, so maximum 15 watt. I think 10 watts is probably a good idea. Um, when you transmit, uh, usually this LED should be on. Um, so you fiddle on the two knobs, alternating until the uh, LED goes off and then you switch back to operate and you're ready to go. I think that's the theory or this is how I understood the manual. Um, and as you can see yeah, in theory, um, it seems to work. I'm able to tune here the whole band. I'm able to get a very sharp dip on 40 meter. So I might not have made too many mistakes. Um, I guess uh, we'll call it a day for this video and um, the real life test is still open and it'll happen when good weather, spare time and ham radio time uh, coincides. So thanks for watching and until next time. Bye!